Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce our second speaker of the morning. Jeff Brand is the um, head of school and dean of um, the School of Media and Communications at Bond University. Um, he has um, a career focusing on the ex exploring the cognitive and behavioural effects of electronic media on young audiences, and most recently has been undertaking a program of research centred on video games as a dominant form of communication. Today, Jeff will be speaking to us about e-textbooks and gaming. Thank you very much. While I set up my technology, I want to, first of all, thank Carolyn McDonald, with whom I worked at uh, Bond University. Uh, she was stolen by Griffith, uh, to my uh, chagrin, and she's very happy there. I'm not going to suggest any more what that might mean. Um, but I was, I was very grateful to be invited to present to you today in an area that I'm uh, quite interested in. And I want to find out how many of you, oh dear, this is quite unwieldy, how many of you are gamers? All right, Cameron's a gamer, I knew that. Cameron and I are on the same wavelength. As you'll see in a moment, I come from a, uh, a pedigree that suggests that I should be as uh, conflicted as uh, the relationship between librarians and the IT crowd. I think I'm ready to go with the technology. So my talk today is uh, entitled Playing E-Textbooks Will End the Style Mate. And I, now you have the camera there. Do you want me to put on the microphone? Or uh, I'm a, I speak American, so I'm plenty loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. All right. So, the first thing I should do is, is say hello and introduce my avatar, Erafon, in the game Skyrim. I'm only a level 12 wood elf, which for anyone who knows anything about computer games, particularly RPGs or role-playing games, this is not a level of accomplishment worthy of wonder and awe. Um, I have very little time, it turns out, to, to nurture my, uh, my virtual existence, but when I'm there, I'm really at peace and really in inspired by the majesty of these complex worlds. So I, I said that I'm conflicted. I'm the, the son of both a teacher and an, engi and an engineer. Uh, my mother is a reading teacher. My father was a launch engineer for NASA. So uh, clearly I've got both of this sort of IT crowd and the librarians thing happening in my own head. Um, I'm also a career academic and very interested in media and young people in particular. Uh, I am also known, and I think, I think uh, Richard Hill would agree, that the programs that I've set up at Bond University are like the Wacademia from the Wild West. I've set up a Bachelor of Computer Games and a Bachelor of Multimedia. And if you want to see what the sentiment is in part of our community at the university, just go on to YouTube and type in Bachelor of Computer Games, uh, and uh, you'll find a video by one of our students that shows a Bundy drinking, console playing, uh, student in residence uh, doing nothing more than wasting his life away. Uh, but I'll talk about the size of this industry in a moment. And I'm also engaged in the Center for Learning, uh, Engagement, Andragogy, and Pedagogy, which is there to sort of explore technology and <laughs> service-based learning and other approaches to uh, student education. Clearly, I'm an immigrant, although I've been in Australia for 17 years, and I have three young boys, so this is really important for my street cred in so many ways. <laughs> now, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that if you want to try to compete with the likes of Cameron, you have to get right to the point and make your conclusion before you actually start. So in an odd way, I want to summarize my talk as though I were finishing it. In essence, I want to suggest that um, learning is endogenous and opportunistic. We are natural learners. We know this biologically. Uh, we know that we are information seekers. We also know that form is a lot less important in the great scheme of things than affordances. Indeed, as natural learners, we're constantly looking for opportunities in our environment with which to pull away whatever it is we need from that environment uh, and whatever it can offer us. Indeed, students and consumers, and, and I know we often cringe when we think of both in the same vein, uh, but both exploit the affordances available to them in the media and the environment that is 
uh, in their space. And in fact, if you think of the experience economy, Pine and Gilmore, the 1989 paper from Harvard University Press, uh, one of the arguments is that we are optim optimally oriented to finding those things which fit with our desire for really interesting and compelling experiences and that ultimately motivate us. So I want to suggest that textbooks and classrooms have limited the affordances available to us uh, as learners. And indeed, uh, they have their place, but those affordances are now being questioned, or the lack of affordances. And what we're finding is young people and old people are discovering that interactive media are offering affordances that they long wanted. So, I want to talk about these mediated affordances, and I want to talk about something that I've been observing now for a few years. I remember that last year was the 100th anniversary of the birth of Marshall McLuhan, and the ABC did a fantastic job of summarizing McLuhan. I like this quote, and I show it to my students, this idea that, that a new medium never ceases to oppress the older media until it finds new shapes and positions for them. I want to suggest to you that the rise of computer games is pushing books to be something more and to provide additional affordances for those people who love books or who need books, as we'll see, uh, for their learning. These are, I don't know if you ever look at Fail Blog, uh, the caption in this textbook says, if you see the number 15, uh, then uh, you have no problem with your vision. And of course, the number 29 uh, is here uh, in the color blindness test. And so you would look at this and go, well, I see 29. I don't see 15. This is a fail in a textbook caption. Here's a textbook that has put another, uh, another um, interesting caption here and put another interesting caption here. The books weren't finished properly before they were sent out and published. And students find these things all the time. They even draw on images in anatomy textbooks, right, to make the books more interesting uh, if slightly fetishized. So users and uh, emerging media push old media to do new things. Now McLuhan also, in this really excellent paper, which is in a collection of essays, uh, in a book that was co-edited by Carpenter and McLuhan uh, in 1960, uh, uh, the paper was origi originally written in 1957, he said books were the first product of mass production, visual aids to oral instruction effectively, but books became the primary and almost the reified epicenter of modern education. As they did, and as new media came along, the new media were suspected as, as being uh, of being only entertainment, and nothing of value could really come from them in terms of a learning or a advanced uh, cognitive context. So I like this idea that McLuhan says, and he, he was on it a long time ago, emerging media are moving toward providing us a more naturalistic set of affordances with which to learn as though we learned uh, before books ever came along. So here is the collective proposition I'm putting together with the research that I've been doing over the past couple of years. First, games are encroaching on the place of books, especially for learning and training. Books and games are converging, in other words. And I remember giving a talk a few years ago that made it into the popular press, and I got a call from uh, a woman in, in uh, New South Wales who said, how dare you? How dare you suggest that books are going, be, are going to be overtaken by games? Games are hideous. And so this is the thing that I'm trying to suggest to you is not worth exploring. Right? It's worth exploring not how uh, these two media are different, but how they can in fact be similar and how their differences, if they exist, can be uh, leveraged for something that provides greater affordances. Now, I call these things playable books. Playable media is a term now that's making uh, the rounds in the academy and suggests media that we engage with in a non-trivial way that allow us to engage uh, in a way that uh, provides joy and interest and fun, uh, but also allows us to toy with affordances. Playable e-textbooks would be a s subset of these. And textbooks, I think, are easily, 
easily ported to playable media because there are already aggregations of lots of other works. Authors put textbooks together by aggregating content. So they're readily disaggregated and repurposed with other tools. And I'm going to give you an example of this. How many of you have seen this app? So you, do you have it? No. I've seen it on TV. You've seen it? Has anyone seen it? Or I'd like to be a bit indulgent then. I want to break out of this um, presentation for a moment. Go to science. Go to the elements and show this to you. So the first thing I want to point out is that if I go to the table of contents, the first thing that appears in the table of contents is the words about this book. Now, a lot of people wouldn't think of this as a book, but in fact, the original product, The Elements, by Theodore Gray, was in fact a book. It was a print book, glossy pages, beautiful, high production quality. If I look at the, in, the, the introduction, let's go back, sorry, right, and the acknowledgments, I see the same sort of front matter that would be in any print book. As I move back to home, back to contents, and I look at, for example, uh, the uh, introduction. I start learning about the periodic table of elements. There's a lot of text here. There are simple static images. It isn't terribly different from a book, although you wouldn't want to get this wet while you're reading. Books are slightly more endurable uh, that way. All right, so this is what I really want to show you, though, when I'm talking about affordances. Uh, let's just choose, okay, that was an accident, but chlorine, all right? The book adds to static color images by animating them. Moreover, it provides a great deal of information about the atomic structure of this particular element, and if I go to the next page, I can see lots of contextual information that tells me how oxygen functions in our lives, in our physical world, and the products that are made with oxygen, or in this case, or it's chlorine. Now, if I wanted to take an object, uh, let's say, what is this? Um, oh, well, we went to calcium. Actually, let's just let me click on this. Now, affordances require appropriate response to the touch. There we go. Uh, and I wasn't touching it probably. Okay, so here we have a skull. I can press the left-right button. And if you're really good with those illusions that go 3D by crossing your eyes, if you just cross your eyes now, if you try a little bit, if you keep going, you'll eventually be able to see that skull in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> And then I can freak you out. <laughs> right. I think we're back to Harry Potter. All right, so I'm done. So this book has lots of text, lots of images, many affordances. I can play with it. I can engage with it. Now back to the regularly scheduled talk. Clearly what this suggests is an environment of disruption. And this is what universities are experiencing, this is certainly what libraries are experiencing, uh, industry is experiencing. This is almost a word for our time. And when I start to suggest to people that Dante's Inferno can be ported from print to an e-book and then from an e-book to a computer game, they often look at me with great suspicion and quite right. Because the computer game may not be a product worthy of academic application or use. Then again, it may be. And indeed, this particular iteration made by a company, Electronic Arts, California-based company, which is known for its pedigree and heritage in the computer games business, one of the largest independent uh, publishers of computer games, meaning independent of console manufacturing and so on. This game is actually really rich material and full of tremendously violent images. 
and affordances and experiences. But then Dante's Inferno has been criticized for its representation of the violent um, story from the Holy Bible. All right, something a little bit more popular, Pound of the Bastardbills, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We can get it as a book. Here, I've just done a screen grab from my iBooks library. <coughs> it was free, so I downloaded it. And there is the Playfish Games version of the same book. Playfish Games have made over 400 interactive games from various works of fiction in the back catalog. That's a shockingly poor game. And a lot of the current ports from books to games are this way. But it's very early days. You might have seen the news, Cameron, given your fascination with Harry Potter, that Sony has just introduced something called the Wonder Book. It's an augmented reality book system. And Wonderbook allows you to take an augmented reality uh, marker, a little tablet, use the wand from the Sony PlayStation Move system, and the, the, the little wand is perfect for a Harry Potter interface, and you can cast spells on your brother or sister to your heart's content. <laughs> so this is what's happening. So my interest in this area, I'm going to just scoot through this very quickly for time, comes from an enduring interest in new media and youth. I conducted a few studies in 2002, 2003, where I it was very clever. I contacted the games industry and asked them for boxes full of computer games, and they gave them to us. <laughs> They're now, this is it, librarians. They're now in the library, aren't they? And uh, much to, I think, the chagrin of library staff where space is at a premium and these are very complex boxes with lots of bits and pieces that are a nightmare to catalog and also control, uh, they're in the collection now. Uh, but we conducted that study. I've also conducted a series of studies for government and the games industry looking at audiences for computer games and demographics. And then we've conducted some research that we've published also on students using the iPad and e-textbooks. Just briefly then, the Diverse Worlds project on computer game content was, a, was an eye-opener for me because I discovered that games were these fantastic worlds, 85% of which had some sort of narrative, even if it was a pseudo-narrative, meaning there's a backstory like a ballet, you know, you have the brochure, the program, it tells you what the context of the play is, and then you go on and uh, engage in performance art in some strange way. Um, we looked at 210 titles, about 300 different observation points, and we published these two studies. They got some, uh, got some traction because one of the things that we looked at, in, in addition to narrative architecture, were formal features and contents, trees. Trees are the most common object in video games. So video games are great. Um, the diverse world, the, sorry, the Digital Australia reports that I've done uh, for the games industry have demonstrated over the years that the proportion of households that have computer games in them has grown from uh, about 78% back in 2005 to over 90% today. Uh, and it used to be that there was a difference between households with children under the age of 18 and households generally, but now that difference has closed. And that's because, as this next slide will show, uh, from 2005 to 2011, the trajectory for the average age of gamers has progressed forward. So now, I mean, in a few years, the average age of a game will be the average age of the population in Australia. That's 36.6 years of age. And I just want to mention this study uh, that we've uh, presented at Ascolite a few times and published as well. Uh, I conducted this with my colleagues in the Office of Quality Learning and Teaching. Uh, we gave our students <coughs> iPad in rotation. Uh, Terry Flew, a lecturer here at, uh, at, at uh, QUT, uh, is the author of the book that I use in my class on new media. And we asked the publisher, Oxford University Press, to turn it into an EPUB. They did fairly quickly, a few weeks. And then they also turned it into a Kindle book. And we made that available to our students to experiment with. And uh, of course, search is the number one affordance that students like in their books. So they can search for convergence and look at how convergence is used in context rather than simply numbers in the back of an index. Quite frankly, I think that's progress. 
and it certainly gets my students engaged. This is the most compelling result in our study. We measured multiple times, so repeated measures, uh, evidence of learning using traditional measures like exam measures and so on. And it turns out, regardless of age and self-managed learning behavior, those who used an iPad, quite inexplicably, had better grades. Hawthorne effect, perhaps. Or is it that affordances, affordances, allow students to own their learning in a way that we haven't yet explored and we don't have a vernacular for um, in our thinking about teaching and learning. All right. Uh, in the time that I have remaining, I just want to finish out my argument on why I think books and games are uh, converging. I want to talk about the rise of e-reading, the rise of tablet computers, IP traffic, uh, the rise of e-textbooks and the rise of computer games and then these emerging affordances I'm speaking of. You may have seen some of this, this uh, commercially uh, produced research, so we have to take that on board as uh, a caveat to thinking about what this research tells us. But it's very clear that across the world, e-books are taking off and e-reading is becoming something that consumers are accepting. Indeed, there's this one blog called The Digital Reader that looked at Bonker, who is, of course, an ISBN clearance house as well as a market research firm. Uh, they've just this year released a report on the international market for e-reading. And I want to go to this next slide. So this blogger <coughs> attended the presentation by Bonker and then took, took photographs of the screen and posted them. And uh, then I've taken them and I've, I've cropped them and represented them here. So I'm not passing them off as mine. They're definitely bulkers. Uh, but Australia has the highest proportion of e-book purchasing, and we probably know why, in the world. So in Australia, it turns out we are very high volume, relatively speaking, e-book buyers. Tablet computers are, of course, as all of them, everybody here is on their iPads. <laughs> they've taken off. Uh, and if it's not the tablet, it's the phablet. If it's not the phablet, it's just the phone. But people have now electronic devices that they're using for reading. And this is absolutely compelling stuff from Forrester Research. Mil uh, uh, global uh, uh, penetration of tablets will reach 760 million, they say, by 2016. And these numbers keep getting revised, and when they're revised, they're revised upward. So the, the uptake is quite profound. We're talking about one seventh, one eighth of the world's population. In the next few years, we'll have a tablet. And these tablets, by the way, are not e-readers. They're computers, and they have fast processors and high-definition screens. Apple calls it a retina display. I'm over it. <laughs> But how many of you have the retina display on your, on the MVS? Right. Uh, mm. Thanks, Cameron. <laughs> You're funnier than me, and you've got a better screen. <laughs> the, the, the displays and the computers and the affordances, therefore, that they provide are all about the heritage of electronic entertainment computer, basically. Computer. Um, this is a fascinating brand new report from Cisco called the Zettabyte Era. You know what comes after a gigabyte? A terabyte. And for terabyte, it's a petabyte. And for petabyte, it's an exabyte. And for exabyte, it's a zettabyte. And for zettabyte, it's a. What is it? The other byte. Who said that? Are you in the IT department? No. no. Ah, very good. I had to look it up. But this is fascinating, right? This is the per capita internet traffic in 1995, a megabyte, uh, sorry, so this is getting up here through 98 to 2000, a megabyte a month, 10 megabytes per month, we're up to a gigabyte per month, right? And so on. The total internet traffic around the world, right, per day is one exabyte in 2013. Internet traffic is going like this. Why? Because there's a lot of video content that's very hungry for space. Where is that video content? Well, of course, it's on YouTube, and it's Fox on the Box, but it's also in books. Many of you who have enriched e-books have already seen these books that contain 
video. Plan 9 from Outer Space. Horrible film. But you can, but it's a great film from the point of view of film studies. There is now a textbook all about Plan 9 from Outer Space. You can read all of the 100 and some odd pages to study it, and at the end of the book you can watch, if you want, the entire film. And you can see what, it, what everybody's on about. Video will consume and populate a lot of these playable books. Uh, Explana is a very commercial operation. They're actually pushing their own products, so we should be careful. But I think they're about right, and they keep revising their growth uh, uh, forecasts. Digital textbooks in North America are taking off. Indeed, this year, 6% of all books. By 2017, they're saying 44%. I'm working with Pearson Higher Education right now. We've built a couple of games for them for some of their um, accident and emergency textbooks. My students produced a game called Betting on the Brain. It's not our IP. It actually belongs to uh, a um, researcher at, and teacher at um, the Australian Catholic University. But we built this game for them. And basically all it is is a race motif that helps uh, accident and emergency nurses learn uh, um, brain anatomy. And it's, you know, it's a lot of fun, and it gets built right into the book. And if we don't want to believe Explana, here's Bacher showing that in Australia, 40% of, um, of, of uh, students have either downloaded for, for free the red bar or purchased uh, an e-textbook. It turns out that e-texts or serious books for, for education or training are very popular in developing countries, Brazil and India are at the top. And it's very interesting to see the, the relative relation, you know, it's a very common uh, relationship between what is free and what is uh, for, um, what, is, what is purchased. This report was re released by PricewaterhouseCoopers at the end of last year. It's called Outlook, Strength, and Numbers. It looks across all the range of media, what's happening with newspapers and magazines and so on. With computer games, and I just want to highlight this, the, this is console and PC games at the top in Australian dollars uh, and mobile game market uh, in Australian dollars. The compound annual growth rate in, around the world is 11% for mobile games, about 4% for console and PC games, so clearly mobile, tablet, phone games are, are taking off. Australia, in both cases, presents a higher growth rate than the rest of the world. We have a very high uptake in computer games. What this means then is that when we compare both ebook growth and tablet growth uh, with game growth, Australia is right at the forefront of this, uh, this process. So here I looked at the apps in the App Store. And we can talk about what's an app and what's a book and what's an app and what's a game and if we want to. But <laughs> these are the two highest categories in terms of frequency count in the App Store. And this is also true in the Google Play Store and in the Amazon Kindle Store. Of course, Amazon Kindle would be more heavily dominated by books. 28,566 uh, a week ago when I looked, 35,000 for games. So games and books are the highest content there. Right, so what does this mean? In summary, the second summary for today, <coughs> I suspect that we will see multiple format uh, modalities available to learners on demand and mobile as a common feature in our classrooms and in our libraries. We're exploring right now the, the Microsoft Surface. It doesn't mean that uh, all students will just have their phones and won't need library services. In fact, the great challenge, I think, um, will be uh, how we coordinate all of this and how we archive and guide students to the right resources at the right time where they need the assistance. We'll be talking about students getting access to content on Surface devices, tablet devices, inside facilities as well as in their pockets. Um, we'll be looking at synchronous and asynchronous experience, disaggregated content use, I'm talking Wikipedia on steroids, uh, unfortunately, and um, exploration and, and integration and interrogation of content uh, at the will of the user as they're curious. 
Uh, we'll also be talking about uh, a lot of self-determination with reward schedules. One of the concerns uh, about games, of course, is that they uh, have reward schedules that, that feed directly into the psychology of players and encourage them to continue uh, without control. But that will be built into books. Now, I'm short on time, so what I want to do is just go to uh, a particular slide, if I could, and finish off with this observation. Where we are is we're at a space where our devices have inbuilt sensors and cameras and the capacity for artificial intelligence. The current standard EPUB 3, which is for ebooks, and HTML5, which is the current web standard, but, and these are, these are actually tied to the hip uh, in terms of programming language, and JavaScript, which allows um, small apps to run inside, means that books can have games built into them. Books will also have sensors to know when you're falling asleep reading your algebra, right? And they'll know to wake up you, not the phone or the tablet, by giving you a stimulus that will say, here's a new way to do maths. There are lots of examples of this already. Um, if you haven't seen this, go have a look at Jonathan Harris's We Feel Fine. Um, you'll need Flash, so forget it if you have an iPad. Uh, so go back to your PC and have a look at it. But what it suggests is already we are building in routines to observe people's moods and to create books with which they can play and books that will love them for play. And that's probably the most provocative place to finish. Okay? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was a very interesting presentation. I've got lots of things I need to go back and have a look at now. So I'd like to thank you very much.